Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, and thanks so much uh, to Lucas and all the organizers at Sonic X for the invitation. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to speak about my, some of my ongoing work and research uh, in this context, and um, this should be about, I don't know, 30, 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, and then I look forward to the discussion. So thanks everyone for coming as well on an early uh, Friday morning in Amsterdam. Um, hopefully I will stay awake. I'm a little bit jet lagged. Uh, so it's, the, it's, like, it's like 1 a.m. In, in my time in California. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, I changed the title a little bit. It's, as you can see, it's called Beyond Despair. Uh, potential worlds and eco fictions. And it begins with a couple epigraphs. So the first one uh, capitalism is a corpse, and we are trapped in it. Uh, in this trap, everything is rotting invention, progress, friendship, and love. Uh, they told us that there is no alternative to capitalism. In this case, we must prepare for war for environmental apocalypse, and for the extinction of the human race, uh, which gets more probable every day. Um, so sorry for beginning on a low note, <laughs> but um, it, it's indeed, yeah, it's a, it's a dark uh, outlook. Um, so this is something I want to talk about, like how can we think about getting beyond uh, despair. A second ep epigraph by Wendy Brown, uh, she writes, how might we address the deep, unavowed nihilism and despair of our time? A nihilism that has been growing for a couple of centuries, as Nietzsche promised, abetted by neoliberal reason. A nihilism that makes truth and reason into a plaything, that makes values fungible, that vitiates conscience and felt responsibility for the present or the future by the powerful and the powerless alike, and a despair that the political, economic, social, and ecological catastrophes on the near horizon emanate from humans' unique capacity to think, create, speak, and inhabit complexity, and also to organize violence and cover the earth with refuse and detritus. What is to be done with this nihilism and despair, indeed? Uh, so the potential worlds of my title I think, offers a speculative proposition that is profoundly generative, uh, helping us to defeat nihilism and despair. Um, and as such, it carries an explosive force within it, for it implicitly recognizes the bankruptcy of the present world, the one most live in, and a, uh, an expansionist one world world that tries to dominate all others, erasing the alternatives. As a container for petrocapitalism's climate catastrophe, uh, beyond grotesque economic inequality, endless war, surveillance, capital, algorithmic oppression, and anti democratic politics, that world is as grievable as it is condemnable. For Wendy Brown, it's a world increasingly given over to what she calls apocalyptic populism, expressed in the desire to bomb problems away undermining democratic institutions, and embracing nihilism. For BIFO, it's dangerously mutating into the corporate authoritarianism, political corruption, and resurgent ethno-nationalist racism of what he terms Nazi liberalism. That world also appears to be destroying itself, as you can see in these images. Um, uh, erupting into wildfires across the globe, like in Australia or in California uh, in recent years, conjuring super hurricanes and destructive floods, and sparking massive protests of multitudes, seeking accountability, justice, and peace despite all. Not surprisingly, we're increasingly surrounded by end-of-world narratives um, within our global culture industry, which pathetically even as it continually represents the end times in endless dystopian sci-fi scenarios, fails repeatedly to imagine any political and economic order meaningfully different from the present. 
those of us dedicated to thinking outside this seemingly inescapable framework thus face the imperative of not only imagining the end of the world, given the real risks of climate catastrophe, uh, nuclear destruction, democratic breakdown, but also how to actively bring it about, right? How can we actively contribute to the end of the world in order to contest its injustice, its political cruelty, and its sheer terror? More, once we've overturned the seeming inevitability of, uh, sorry, the seeming invincibility of the logic of there is no alternative, we have to ask ourselves, how can we imagine new worlds? How can we bring into being what some call a just transition, a movement toward justice, as much as an equitable transformation? And this is just one diagram uh, that shows you what a just transition uh, could mean. It's developed by the, the group Movement Generation, which is a, a people of color-led uh, climate justice and environmental justice organization in Oakland, California, uh, that shows you um, a roadmap for how we might uh, move from an extractive economy to a liberal economy. Um, so I'll just leave that up uh, for a, a few seconds. Um, so in, in asking the question, how can we imagine new worlds and envisage a just transition, two relevant genealogies come to mind as being particularly helpful in this regard. Uh, and in some ways, they come from my own uh, US-based uh, uh, perspective. The first emerges out of the black radical tradition in the US, ex as exemplified by the, um, quote, ra radical revolution in values demanded by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the context of the anti-racist civil rights struggle of the late 1960s. Increasingly, in his late activism before his assassination, King was directed was directing his social movement energies toward challenging what he called the evil triplets of militarism, materialism, and racism, particularly as they were manifesting themselves in the US war in Vietnam, accompanied by growing economic inequality and anti-black violence back at home. How might we replace those evil triplets with love, equity, and justice? became the ultimate struggle for Dr. King, which has transcended his untimely death and continues to this day in the wake, that is, of the movement for black lives and with the persistence today of endless war, increased economic inequality, and the resurgence of white nationalism, as articulated, for instance, more recently by Kianga Yamada Taylor, who you see on the bottom right. Uh, she spoke recently as part of the, um, the, this research project that I've organized at UC Santa Cruz called Beyond the End of the World. So Kianga Yamada Taylor writes, indeed, the conditions warranting class struggle have become worse as the wealth within US society has continued to accrue at the top. Yet King's ability to name the elemental human suffering that is produced by our profit system, while simultaneously demonstrating the centrality of the black movement but in unraveling its internal and external logic, remains a powerful political tool. So that's one genealogy from King to Kianga Yamada Taylor. There's lots more, that's just a, 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 a um, uh, an abbreviated version of uh, what we could call the black radical tradition in, in the US, and particularly emphasizing its radical uh, anti-capitalist elements. The second genealogy is that of the manifold indigenous struggles against the world of colonization, unfolding over centuries of Western capitalist expansion. As the Zapatistas have consistently argued since their insurrection commenced in 1994, and in alliance with all the other indigenous movements for self-determination and sovereignty found across the world today. They, <clears throat> they say, we are the product of 500 years of struggle, first against slavery, then during the War of Independence against Spain led by insurgents, then to avoid being absorbed by North American imperialism. But today we say enough is enough. We are the inheritors of the true builders of our nation, the dispossessed, we are millions, and we thereby call upon our brothers and sisters to join the struggle as the only path. Many have indeed joined that global struggle waged against land theft, 
and extractive projects, treaty violations, and fossil fuel infrastructure expansion, and have done so since the very beginnings of colonization. In response to one of the most recent and highly visible examples of anti-colonial resistance, uh, that of land and water protectors battling the installation of the Dakota Access Pipeline um, that occurred in the U.S. in 2016. The historian and citizen of the Lower Brule Sioux Tribe, uh, Nick Estes, made this succinct observation. He, he wrote, for the earth to live, capitalism must die. So the ongoing burning demand uh, then is not only how to speed up the end of the world, but how to inaugurate a new one, founded upon radical equality, social and multi-species justice, and ecological sustainability, something more than what our present institutions could possibly contain. Such a vision is inspired by the black radical tradition and associated anti-colonial struggles, indigenous movements for the rights of nature, and by a post-extractivist eco-socialism. Thinking with the Zapatistas, and indeed um, with new expressions of just such a world and what it would require, that it would, re that it would require ultimately something more than a one-world world. Uh, indeed, it would require something like a pluriverse or, or a cosmopolitics of plurality, of multiplicity, uh, a world of many potential worlds, as the Zapatistas say. The world we want is one where many worlds fit. It may seem <clears throat> in, this, in this context that I've very briefly laid out uh, absurd to talk about art and fiction and storytelling in the present context of resurgent xenophobia, apocalyptic outrage, cancel culture, endless wars, and generalized dispossession. But any construction of a new alternative or, pot or potential world I think can only begin by its creative imagination. In a growing era where negativity seems to have become ontological, premised on the essentialization of hatred, of misogyny, of nativism, and racism, where even the capacity to imagine a future different from the present has been thoroughly corroded, it becomes profoundly political to challenge this debilitating fatalism and to insist to insist against all odds uh, that change is conceivable, that nature is not immutable, and that another world is possible. This insistence presents us with a newfound urgency for creative aesthetics, not as an irresponsible utopian imagination without consequences, and even less as a cynical instrument of institutional appropriation but rather as a militant image put to task in the imagining of new worlds, realizing, for instance, the radical potential long understood in some versions of cultural theory. In a similar way to how Michel Foucault once discussed the capacity to fictionalize a political outlook that does not yet exist starting from a historical truth in an effort to make it real, so too can we consider operationalizing fiction with transformational material consequences today. In the same way that Jacques Ranciere understands fiction not as a means of feigning, but rather of forging the real, constructing a system of, rep of uh, represented actions and assembled forms that builds new worlds, so too can we unleash imaginative approaches that do that work. In the same way that the author Octavia Butler wrote that we are in an imagination battle, only we're trapped inside someone else's imagination. So too can we agree with Adrian Murray Brown, who urges us more recently to break free from that trap. She writes, science fiction is simply a way to practice the future together. I suspect that that is what many of you are up to, practicing futures together, practicing justice together, living into new stories. It is our right and responsibility to create a new world. From that generative basis, diversely theorized, eco-fiction emerges, 
bringing about the formation of new worlds founded upon a paradigm-shifting ecocentric imperative, overcoming the environmental destruction of global capitalism by practicing a different, just future together. Ecofiction uh, constitutes nothing less than what we can call a radical futurity in two fundamental senses. First, its etymology, that of uh, radical, uh, reaches into the roots, connecting with the land, with the more than human realm, proposing a biodiverse flourishing beyond anthropocentrism. Ecofiction proposes the aesthetic terms of what Donna Haraway calls the Thulucine, a long existing, a long suppressed, and now emergent socio-geological epoch founded upon sympoetic multi-species nature. Uh, and multi-species being and becoming, which resists the Anthropocene's bounded individuality, its mastery of nature, and its neo-humanist techno-utopianism. The Terrans of the Thulucene, those firmly committed to flourishing, the, the flourishing of life on Earth, reject colonizing nature by economic value, uh, reducing land to property and commodification, financializing the elements, monetizing natural processes, as is the tendency with, within green capitalist approaches to climate mitigation and environmental conservation, as much as biogenetic science and geoengineering. Rather, with ecofiction, new, new sources of, of worth emerge from the ground up in collaboration with the elements of soil, air, and water, supporting the web of life that is intrinsically valuable. So beginning with our roots, that is radical. In a second sense, ecofiction expresses a radical politics, meaning that it grounds itself in a critical analysis of the structural conditions of reality's production and envisions transformation beyond the current techno-economic and socio-political arrangements. In this regard, one might argue, as has uh, Frederick Jameson, that ecofiction's most radical structural quality is to imagine the future as disruption. Its looking ahead is not premised upon the realization of an already conceptualized plan or program, but rather practices imagining what's to come as unpredictable to some degree and profoundly different from the current governing system of global capitalism. That is, it opposes capitalism's own colonization of futurity, whether through its neutralization via risk assessment or through the algorithmic capture of the unknown. Instead, we arrive at ecofiction's radical potentiality to constitute a radical and systemic break with even that predicted and colonized future, which is simply a prolongation of our capitalist present. Um, so that short passage is about how, you know, how can we radicalize and reclaim our relation to futurity, where the future is not simply an, an uh, endless extension of uh, what we know today. Right? How can we envision, envisage the, fruit, the future as rupture? If we look toward the most, I think, the most ambitious versions of radical futurism, including the multiple iterations of Afrofuturism, of indigenous futurism, and eco-socialist futurism, in other words, those that propose a modeling of the future as disruption, we can discern a shared methodological basis for what radical imagination is. These visions of emancipation are grounded in the traditions of the oppressed, including long-standing struggles against colonial violence, against racism, against economic exploitation, against resource extraction. In other words, there's no blank slate thinking. Rather, creativity grows from the situated experiences and material histories of violence and dispossession and mobilizes past collective resistance as a resource for present struggles. One example is uh, the work of black quantum futurism. Um, uh, and uh, one of their members, Moore Mother, participated in Sonic Acts last year. Um, this is not, this dedication to radical or radical imagination is not simply a matter of choice, moreover, but rather a recognition of the ongoingness of injustice, only updated with new technologies and communication systems, economic uh, mechanisms, militarized police, and media, which can 
only continue, which we can only continue to struggle against. Radical futurist methodology recognizes that past violence is not simply past, but continues in present conditions, much like the material traces of slavery and colonialism translate into mass incarceration and current day land grabs or data colonialism founded upon biased facial recognition and surveillance technologies, uh, and terrorist lawfare directed at land and water protectors, along with vigilante and death squad violence. If that recognition goes unregistered uh, of the continuities of oppression, then we risk perpetuating the violence, allowing the dominance of capitalist extractive and white supremacist futures to end up defuturing whole populations, whole peoples, species, and life ways. Cultural practice then offers a space for this project of radical futurist imagination, but it's important to recognize that its very framing conditions, its urgent socio-ecological imperatives, necessitate also the transformation of what cultural practice is and can be. Of course, Dominant art institutions continue to invest their substantial resources into luxury object production for the financial elite, supporting commercial spaces of enclosure dedicated to individualist aesthetic autonomy premised on abstraction and social irrelevance, the perfect vehicles for art washing and green washing of corporate profits. We see this particularly in some of the dominant institutions in, in, in the US. But vitally, there's also an ongoing structural transformation of creative forms in collective movements of struggle, striving to invent new worlds. Ethico-political imperatives, in other words, what King and Taylor referred to as the radical revolution of values, places new demands on the fundamental artistic elements of form and content and distribution. Um, as the artist, for one example, as the artist activists associated with the MTL and uh, Decolonize This Place collective based in New York uh, put it, um, they write, what if as artists and cultural producers, when we speak of art and activism, we put, we put both under erasure? What if we strike art in the same way that one uh, a worker conducts a strike? What if we strike art to liberate itself, it, it from itself, not to end art, but to free it from the circuits of capital, white supremacy, settler colonialism, and debt, and to unleash its powers to imagine that which is not immediately apparent. And what if, as we reject the specialization of activism, we choose a never-ending process of experimentation and questioning, or we choose, as the Zapatistas say, to make the path by walking, let art be training in the practice of decolonial freedom. That double strike and emancipation of activist art is in fact widespread. It connects, for instance, with recent formations around, for instance, uh, trainings for the not yet, organized by Jean of Van Heswick and uh, Bach in Utrecht recently last fall, dedicated to an assembly of people, communities, ideas, objects, rehearsals, art, shared food, research, talks, politics, performances, screenings, teachings, and learnings, as well as the manifold tr transversal relations among them, beginning with the question, how to be together otherwise? And what I like about this is just the um, proliferation of categories and forms of life and practices. Um, that starts with that massively ambitious question of how do we transform basically everything, right? How do we rethink being together otherwise? Um, this movement toward collective assemblies for the purpose of decolonizing the future also connects to the work of multiple communities and practitioners, bringing to mind, for instance, uh, Jonas Stahl's stagecraft and organized under the similar name, Training for the Future. He writes, in a time of increasing global crises in politics, economy, and ecology, a dystopia has turned into the new norm. Training for the future is a utopian training camp where audiences are turned into trainees to pre-enact alternative scenarios and reclaim the means of production of the future. Its faculty of trainers consists of futurologists, hackers, 
extraterritorial activists, cooperative game designers, and interplanetary organizations. In Stahl's newly articulated theorization of art as propaganda, emancipatory collective forms of empowerment become aesthetic and political, dedicated to the practice of world building. So I see, in relationship to this kind of practice, three arcs of political aesthetic transformation that particularly stand out in relation to eco-fictional cultural practice. The first uh, is what we can call uh, intersectionality, which is a term that's quite familiar within US or, or you know, British and American uh, political activist discourse, but maybe not so familiar within, <clears throat> within a European context. Um, so the first is intersectionality. Not surprising given King's, if you recall, King's focus on the interconnected nexus of militarism, materialism, and racism, and the need to think those, those forms of oppression and violence together in interlinked ways. Right? We can't just address one without addressing the other. This is the, the foundation of intersectionalist thinking. Subsequent iter iterations of intersectionality stemming from the analyses within African American uh, legality and activism and political thinking from people like uh, Kimberly Crenshaw to uh, Angela Davis, among others, has stressed the necessity of addressing interlinked oppressions and discrimination. Those, for instance, according to race and gender or sex, ability, nationality, and so on, which cannot be pulled apart. Accordingly, trainings for the not yet also require interlinked struggles of resistance. If not, cultural practice risks becoming specialized as a single issue engagement, uh, abstracting economic inequality, for instance, from environmental devastation. Another risk of intersectionality as practiced by some is the essentialist separation of identity politics, where cons the consideration of race relations for example, might exclude addressing class divisions. The re result can be mobilized, we know, by ruling, cr ruling economic and political cl classes to divide and conquer the left, imploding into so many competing identities. As Kianga Yamada-Taylor writes, opposition movements thus require a broad multiracial struggle to successfully engage in a radical revolution of values at necessary scale beginning with mobilizing for a redistribution of economic power, which she sources again in the late stages, the late stage struggles uh, of Martin Luther King and his anti-capitalism, uh, as well as Black Panther uh, Mutual Aid and the Cumbahee River Collective's advocacy for, for uh, forms of solidarity across difference. Increasingly central to current concerns are also ecology and environment, as further areas of violence and oppression in terms of extractivism, spreading toxicity, weaponized atmospheres, and militarized border zones, which we know disproportionately impact impoverished frontline communities of color, particularly in the global south. This is occurring as green capitalist initiatives attempt to delink climate solutions from social justice struggles, limiting approaches to, to address climate change to technocratic attempts to manage carbon pollution and thereby to maintain the socioeconomic status quo. So this is, these are, this is the, I'm just pointing very briefly to the dangers of green capitalist approaches to climate solutions. Our response must be clear. Radical art demands uh, what I, for one, have called an intersectionalist ecology, liberating ecology from affluence, from whiteness, from a more than human priorities, uh, and grounding environmental science and social and economic justice for all. In fact, science is increasingly connecting with political economy. Uh, as writes Nicholas uh, Bure, he, he says, uh, we need a radically egalitarian um, communist degrowth. Uh, re recent years have thus thrown up numerous scientific papers, all essentially calling for the end of capitalism. To some extent, science calls for nothing less than full communism. 
I think this is really interesting in terms of uh, political transformations within, within science itself that are pointing in this direction. Uh, the second arc of transformation is the urgency to resist the ontological turn, where, especially where it essentializes identities beyond and outside politics, against prevailing liberal tendencies to ontologize negativity, to see, for instance, misogyny as something beyond politics, as if it were genetic, or what uh, Jody Dean criticizes as gyno-pessimism in a recent text of hers or to see racism as fundamental somehow to European modernity, as with certain versions of Afro-pessimism, or to see eco-catastrophe as somehow an inevitable part of human nature, according to which we can only learn to, live how to, to learn how to live and die, as in Roy Scranton's formulations. Against all these tendencies, we must struggle against moralizing, biologizing form formulations that terminate in a debilitating fatalism. The alternative here is to recommit to the political, uh, resisting the immutable and the defeatism of the unchangeable. Asserting the theoretical possibility of potential worlds can become part of our rallying cry. This does not mean that ontological divergence does not exist, for instance, between worlds within multinaturalism, according to differing ontoepistemological paradigms, as discussed, for instance, in the indigenous-focused anthropology of someone like Eduardo Viveros de Castro or in Haraway's uh, political geology. But in these cases, we confront not the problematic ontologization of the political, reduced to so many essentialisms and depoliticized fatalisms, but rather the politicization of the ontological, expanded to a cosmopolitical site of negotiation between worlds. So I know that was really fast and very theoretical, but we, maybe we can talk about this in the conversation if you'd like. Uh, at root is the very generative indeterminacy of nature that cannot be essentialized much less financialized, as it forms a site, for instance, according to Karen Barad, my colleague at UCSC, it forms a site, nature forms a site of self-differing multiplicity and radical alterity. In this regard, eco-fictional aesthetics, in one guise, might provide the experimental protocol and structures for the negotiation of difference across onto-epistemological divides, for instance, between indigenous land-based struggles and eco-socialist environmentalism. Perhaps, again, what Jonas Stahl and Jeanne van Heswick are trying to get at with their spatial laboratories and social diagrams for collectivist production of futurist imagination. With intersectionality and political ontology, solidarity becomes critical as the third arc of aesthetico-political transformation. The goal here is to build mutual aid systems that infuse social movement struggle with radical solidarity across difference and against ruling class power. Solidarity de designates the mode of political belonging that builds collectives and strengthens movements and puts alliance building into action according to a common shared political project. Its primary agent uh, for Jody Dean is uh, the comrade the central figure in the emancipatory egalitarian struggle of the proletarianized against capitalist exploitation, where the end of comradeship is the end of the world. Non-meaning, incoherence, madness, the, and the pointless, disorienting insistence of the I. In other words, the dystopia of present reality and its, its fetishization of individualism. At a time when being and belonging have become largely colonized by capital, riven by identitarian separatism, differentiated by essentialism, emancipatory relations are crucial in reaching political goals. Uh, knowing that we can only enact an effective politics of structural transformation if social movements are joined together. So the stakes are enormous in a time of uh, threatening, encroaching fascism worldwide. 
This is reflected in the increasing centrality of collective struggles that possess revolutionary objectives, whether of decolonization or deprivatization, anti-extraction, anti-racism, anti-sexism, including those determined to liberate institutions from toxic funding and art washing patronage perpetuated by oppressive corporate power. Moving from the impossible to the inevitable, in making potential worlds necessary, solidarity makes all the difference. Um, so in conclusion, looking ahead to a world in which uh, many worlds fit, as the Zapatistas demand, how would we negotiate between these worlds? And what if they entered into collision? I'm just citing a, a recent text uh, by Marisol de la Cadena and Mario Blazer that addresses some of these political questions. Uh, of a world of many worlds. Um, what new forms of diplomacy would be required to avoid the threat of trans-world domination, of onto-epistemological asymmetry, of the inequality of power and resources with which we're so familiar today? These are speculative questions without much precedence in actual governance. Uh, with perhaps the closest model being the United Nations, which has largely failed in providing a neutral institution for negotiating among un unequal powers, let alone those that fail to share a common epistemic horizon. But we can begin to describe its political conditions. Uh, Marisol de la Cadena and Bruce Blazer designate the site of, con of divergence between, com between worlds as the uncommons. So not the commons, but the uncommons, by which they mean the heterogeneous grounds where negotiations take place toward a commons that would be the continuous achievement, an event whose vocation is not to be final because it remembers that the uncommons is its constant starting point. Perhaps the fundamental condition of potential worlds then, and the basis upon which they can assert their insurgent universality which will be, the necessary, will be the necessary incompleteness of their experiment, as Max Tomba argues in, in his recent book called Insurgent Universality, and thus the infinite necessity of politics. This points to one further condition for artistic models developing juridical political protocol and infrastructure, for modeling institutional sites of cosmopolitical plurality and negotiation their experiments in world building can only be incomplete. Thank you. <laughs>